So I'm Javed and Florian. Uh, so the tutorial today is on how to write schedulers in LVM that give you great performance. So uh, a bit of warning, uh, so there is no easy path, no royal way to getting great performance. And we don't promise you that. What we are trying to achieve in this tutorial is give us more structured way by which you could uh, write your schedulers, not for just one processor, but a set of processors for your target, so that on average you get good performance and you take the right approach. So there have been a couple of uh, presentations in, in similar forums on schedulers in LVM. Uh, this being a tutorial builds on them and goes further and deeper, so which does mean at points it, it gets a bit intricate and uh, complex if you wish, but we are trying to bring to you as much details as we can possibly so to do a good justice to this tutorial and to give maximum benefit to you. Right, with that, so we will cover the following topics. Uh, start off with an introduction, actually a bit of very brief recap on instruction scheduling, which I'm sure you all know, just to jog our memory, and then Florian will get into uh, the details of scheduling as it happens in LVM. So the scheduling algorithm and uh, how the scheduler fits into the overall LVM flow. The scheduler needs a very precise, good model of the processor pipeline. So I'll be going into the how you model the process pipeline in LVM using the magic of table gen. And at that point, we already have a, enough to model a good uh, scheduler in LVM, but there are times when you want to extend the generic default scheduler to customize it, to extend it in certain ways to fit your purpose, and we'll get into that after that, and we'll finish off with some uh, general guidelines and closing remarks. Right, so just a quick recap. So scheduling, as you know, is reordering of instructions to reduce stalls so that you have fewer cases where you have instructions sitting and waiting in dispatch, unable to issue because the input operands are not ready or the resources, functional units, are not available. So you will always have that, but you want fewer instances of that. You want to maximize the issue width, and you want the sequence of code uh, instructions that are presented to the register allocator, so this is scheduling before register allocation, to be in such a way that you have fewer instances of spilling. So these asks are quite uh, big and sometimes they're conflicting with each other. Uh, how do you do that? What does it even mean, some of these terms? A good place to start is the processor pipeline because that's what we're trying to optimize. So a quick recap, as you know, so in, in modern processors, it goes typically like this. It's a very simplified model. So instructions are fetched and decoded. And if the input operands are available and the resources or functional units are available, they are dispatched and issued. So instructions are issued to, uh, so if you have an add or subtract, uh, that would typically issue to an ALU, load store would likewise issued to a load store unit. And you may have more than, so you might in a processor have two or three ALU, two or three multipliers. You might have also uh, multiple issue capabilities. So in each cycle, the processor is able to issue more than one instruction. Now, uh, you also would have in order and out of processor. So in order processor issue instructions in the order in the sequence of the program code that's presented to them. Out of order, of course, issue out of order, so, but the commit of results is in order for program correctness. So let's have a look at a flow of instructions through an actual pipeline. So at, what I show here is uh, at time t0, you have an add that's been fetched. At time t1 or cycle, next cycle, it's decoded, and because its input are ready, at T2 it is issued to the ALU pipe. At the same time, the multiply instruction, as you can see, has been fetched and decoded, so 
in the next cycle, which is T3, it's issued to the multiplier. So that's typically how it works in a pipeline uh, processor. Now, at time T4, the divide which was fetched and decoded could have been issued, but its inputs are not ready. They're still being computed by the add. It needs the output from the add, and it's not ready yet, and you have a stall. So that's a very simple case where a bad schedule ends up with you losing cycles, where you are not able to do some, uh, something useful. So, and in this case, you have to. So, scheduling is an NP hard problem, even in simple cases. So, uh, compile time, you want it to be fine. Uh, you, have, you want to do it as quickly and efficiently as you want, as you can. So, uh, since 1970, uh, the standard way is the list scheduling, and LVM uses that in certain flavors. So list scheduling works typically like this. You have uh, here a DAG, so the node of this DAG is instructions, and the edges are dependencies, and the weights I've shown here is the latency. The list scheduling basically picks up what's the next best instruction to schedule and schedule them. So it has a ready queue, so if you see in this simple diagram, you have I0, I1, and I2, which, are, which have the inputs ready, so they can, they can be scheduled. Uh, the onus is on the scheduling to decide which is the right instruction to issue in the next cycle. So it uses a bunch of heuristics, and Florian will get into that. It decides what, to pick one of them, and then simulates the next cycles. So as more and more instructions are uh, picked from the ready queue, and issued, some more instructions will, will become available and they will be issued. So this makes it a bit a linear time cycle. So with that, to get into details, Florian. Okay. <clears throat> so I just want to give you a high level overview of um, scheduling an LLVM and how it, how it fits into LLVM. And to start with, I want to uh, briefly talk about the two schedulers, basically, that are still in use in LLVM. There is the schedule the RR list scheduler, which is kind of the, the legacy scheduler, but it's still used by quite a few backends. Um, and so this scheduler basically does what Travit explained earlier. So it brings the selection DAG into a linear order of machine instructions. And um, it supports different heuristics to use to decide the order of the instructions. So for example, it can use the source order of the instructions, so it can use an order that reduces uh, register pressure. Um, yeah, but for new backends, um, you shouldn't use that um, scheduler, but you should use um, the machine scheduler, which is um, the new scheduler in LLVM. But yeah, at this point, it's been around for a couple of years um, as well. Um, it allows a very nice modeling of the resource, the processor resource usage on a per instruction basis, and Charvet will talk about that um, later. And it also does a better job at tracking uh, things like um, uh, liveness of registers, and it does a better job at modeling the, the, the simulating the, the processor pipeline. And it's also easier to customize and extend, which we're going to talk about uh, later as well. Um, and then one interesting thing to know is that the uh, machine scheduler still relies on the schedule that our list scheduler to bring the machine instructions into linear order. Um, yeah, but it uses the source order, the fast uh, heuristics for that. So um, now let's look into how the scheduling fits into the LLVM pipeline. This is a very simple uh, view of the of the of the pipeline. And if you want to know more details, um, a more detailed pipeline overview. I suggest that you have a look at Matthias's uh, presentation. But there are basically two points where scheduling happens in LLVM. One is before and one after register allocation. So um, what we start out before register allocation is uh, just um, basic blocks with lists of machine instructions. And at this point, we still have virtual registers, not physical registers. So the input to the scheduler is um, least constrained. And um, it still has lots of flexibility. But um, when, we, when we do scheduling, one thing to consider is that the schedule will impact the register allocator. So an important thing to consider is what impact the, the schedule on, will have on the register allocator. So in this example on the slide here, 
um, the definition and uses of the virtual registers are far apart, so the life ranges are potentially big, which makes life for the register allocator harder if you would uh, just schedule them closer together, which um, might have other problems, but at least for the register allocator, it's easier. Uh, so that's one thing to consider. And then um, when register allocate, the register allocator then maps the virtual registers to a smaller set of physical registers, and this introduces um, false dependencies, which makes life harder for the post-register location, as when we do scheduling after register location, because we have all those false dependencies introduced by the register allocator. But um, we still, there's still the possibility to do scheduling here, and at this stage we can schedule very aggressively for, for latency and resource usage, because the registers have already been assigned, and this can be helpful to schedule um, spill code that was added um, after the register allocator. So, um, so just want to give you a quick high-level overview about the kind of scheduling decisions that the, the machine scheduler in LLVM makes. Um, so there's different strategies or directions where, um, where it does the scheduling. Um, the default thing is to do bidirectional scheduling, which basically does um, top-down and bottom-up scheduling of a, of a block um, concurrently or simultaneously and picks the best from either, either direction, the best candidate. To pick, uh, to decide which candidate should be picked next, the machine scheduler uses a set of heuristics that are implemented in the try candidate function. Um, it schedules within uh, basic blocks. Um, yeah, and so there's also global scheduling, um, which is an interesting topic and has been discussed in LLVM where uh, instead of scheduling within basic blocks, we consider the whole function or the whole program. Yeah, and if you're interested in that, there are two links there, which I'd suggest to you have a look at. Um, okay. So this is a very rough overview um, of the heuristics that the generic machine scheduler uses. I, I won't go into the details there, but the basic idea is that there's a, it's a hierarchical cost function to rank um, scheduling candidates amongst each other. Um, yeah, and it's just a set of heuristics that gets supplied one after the other, and um, it's a greedy cost function, so <clears throat> once, it, once a heuristic decides that one node is better than the other, it will not consider the other heuristics. Um, so just to give you an intuitive idea how the scheduling uh, looks with the machine scheduler, um, let's have a look at this um, example here. And we want to yeah, think about the schedule for a simple CPU which can issue two instructions per cycle and has one integer and one store unit. And if we look at, the, um, at that schedule there, um, we can see that we have a bunch of first execute, uh, a bunch of integer instructions, and then a bunch of store instructions. So in each cycle, we don't make optimal use of our um, available resources. And yeah, let's just take a look at what, how the machine scheduler would balance the, that schedule and how the algorithm would roughly work. So this, this is a very simple, um, simple um, explanation just, just to give you an idea. Um, so we start with a set uh, of nodes. Um, so for top-down scheduling, we use the entry nodes, and for bottom-up scheduling, we use the uh, exit nodes, the starting points. And then um, we apply the, the cost function to the, to the set of available nodes, and we prioritize scheduling the, the physical register copies in the beginning, and then um, after we scheduled um, the first two instructions from, from the top, we um, bump the cycle in our simulation and um, yeah, keep track of the resources used. Um, so we use two integer, um, issue two integer instructions there, and then we continue on as we yeah, pick more candidates. And then at this point, we issued um, from bottom up like, um, the second store instruction, and at this point, um, we can either schedule the store, inst the, the third store instruction, or the uh, subtractive uh, instruction. And because we already scheduled an um, store instruction, it's better to pick the, uh, the integer instruction, and then uh, we schedule the rest of the instructions. And by reordering the instructions, we make uh, better use of the available resources. Okay, and with that, um, I hand over to, to Charlie. 
Thanks. Thanks, Rory. So I'm back to talk about uh, table gen, which we all love and uh, is used for modeling the pipeline in our VM. The, the scheduler overall works like this. Uh, so you have the schedule DAG MI, which is the one that builds the DAG and the does the overall is a driver for the list scheduling. The scheduler is the one that Florian was talking about where it uses a heuristic. So it's a, it's a brain, if you wish, which picks up the, which, which is the next node to, to schedule. To, to make that decision, it uh, needs the DAG, but also needs to know how the real processor is going to work when these instructions flow through it. So that's where the model of the processor comes in. So what's going to happen in the real processor, if it can simulate it as accurately as possible, then you would have a situation where it knows what's going to happen when you actually execute this code. And then it can say, okay, this is not going to work, this is going to work, this is where we'll have uh, stalls. So this is the target schedule model, and that's the topic of the next few slides. Right, so uh, this set of slides are organized in, in this way. So first we'll cover basics, but it's not really basics, but it, it's a set of steps that will give you a good model with which you could already get some very good performance. And in my experience, I already got very good performance just following these. And then we'll touch on things which uh, hardware designers love to put in, new features in, in the processor pipeline, which sometimes can very, become very difficult to model in, in the table gen language, but it's possible. But you need to have a lot more vocabulary and we'll cover those. Right, so these four steps I'm going to cover are this. So before we start thinking of a particular processor and how to model this pipeline, it's good to step back and think about the whole target and see and classify instructions. So suppose you have add and subtract. They behave very similar in terms of the pipeline behavior compared to, let's say, load and store. So the first step is to categorize these instructions. So one example, as I said, was add and subtract. So they, they, you, those you can classify as ALU operations. Multipliers, if they behave very differently in terms of cycles, the, the f functional unit that they need, or in that terminology of LVM resources, now you may further classify at the target level if you know that most of your processes are going to behave like this. So for example, add with shift might take more cycles than just a pure add. So you can go further and refine it. And where to stop, that's very subjective. It depends on your target, it depends on your experience, et cetera. But it's an investment that you make at the target level to organize and categorize these instructions. So once you've done that, then you associate these categories with actual instructions. After you've done that, so this is initial investment for your target. Then you go to sub-target for individual processors and do a set of things. So these four steps, which you see here, I'll cover with actual examples. So the first step, the categorization. Step one, so each target at your target level, so this example is for ARM schedule.td, it's a real, Real, if you, if you see, open the file, you'll see this. That classification, uh, which we did very early on, was okay, classify, uh, have a write ALU. This is a classification of writes of an operation after an ALU operation. So the machine scheduler works in operands. So input operands, what you need, and what you produce. So you might have for add, let's say, two inputs coming in and an output. Sometimes you may have three inputs. So for each of these, you define something called schedule. So it gets a bit complicated, but once you get into that thinking, you realize that yes, this is the right way to do it, and it's more accurate. So in this example, so you have a write ALU, it's a, for a dev, and a read ALU. So read ALU is, is when you are reading the input operands, and write ALU is when you're writing it. So this is just one classification, it did not be right. Uh, you can further refine it. If you're wondering what is this uh, sched write, sched read, these are defined in the target schedule. These are just types with which you build further. 
So once we have this, then you attach these categories to actual instructions. So in this example, you see for multiply, you have a read mul two, so a multiplication reads two inputs and produces an output. So at a very top level, you say, okay, uh, I'm attaching to this mul, which was already defined in this ARM instruction info.td, I'm putting that extra thing called sched, which defines the schedule for the input and output operands, right? So we've defined categories, categories which are categories of, of schedules, and we've attached them to instructions. And as you can see, this is, we're not talking about a specific processor at this point, we're talking about the whole target. The next step is where you delve into the actual processor. The first step you do there is define top level features of the pipeline. So the micro op buffer size, which you see is the also known as reorder buffer size. So in this example, you see it is zero. Basically, it means it's an in-order processor. It doesn't have a reorder buffer. If, you, if it was an out-of-order processor with a certain size of reorder buffer, you put that there. It's an issue with self-explanatory. Uh, so for this example, uh, Cortex-R52 is a dual issue. And there's some other parameters which, if the machine schedule doesn't use, other parts of the, uh, of the backend will use it. So uh, you define these things for your sub-target, and then you define for your sub-target the, the functional units, also known as resources. So in this example, uh, it says for Cortex-R52, there are two ALUs, and uh, yeah, it's buffer size zero, it says in order processor. And the last step, the step four, so we, what we did was, just to recap, so we defined categories for instructions, we attached those categories to actual instructions, then we went to the sub-processor, uh, sub-target, and for each processor we said what functional units we have, what resources, how many adders, uh, how many multipliers we have, and then we say, okay, for those categories that we defined, how do they map to these functional units and latencies? So that's the last step you see, uh, where with the write rest, you are saying, just as an example, so write ALU. So when you're writing to an ALU, it takes a latency of three. It will be three cycles operation, and it needs an unit, uh, a resource, AP2. Uh, so just a uh, name that you give for your processor, so unit ALU, right, and same for multiplier. So with these four steps, what, what we have done is define at a very nice level, if you've done the initial investment uh, for, for your target of categorization, uh, details for your processor. Uh, because table gen can get complicated, you may want to uh, just print some debugs. So here you can see some examples uh, for what we defined for uh, R52. Okay, it's self-explanatory, two, two units uh, and uh, latency and stuff. Also, when the scheduler is actually running, uh, you can do a debug and you can see the latencies that you programmed in. So these help, so in case like it's a bit complicated, like mm, am I defining it in the right way? So when, when you do this debug printouts, you can see, ah, yes, it, it is reading it the way I gave it. Uh, just a, a couple of points on order of order processor. I mentioned thing, uh, already, uh, if you define the buffer size, it will uh, simulate as if it's a re, uh, auto order processor, so it will issue instructions for which the inputs are not yet ready, and it uses uh, that in some other logic inside uh, to do. It doesn't go and simulate all the way in terms of the sequencing of instructions, the reservation stations, but it goes quite uh, well in terms of uh, what practically would be useful. Right, so the next set of slides is on uh, more features in your hardware that might be useful that you want to model. So the first one is a pipeline forwarding. So easiest to explain with examples. So you have a division and that produces uh, something that is consumed by the add and the multiply. Let's say the division takes eight cycles. So uh, after division, the, the add and the multiply can be issued eight cycles later. So this is what the default, so what we defined in terms of categorization at the target level, let's say, and what we put in. Now, let it be the case that actually the inputs for the read 
It doesn't need it right at the beginning. It needs it after one cycle. Uh, let's say in this case, two cycles, and the multiply after one cycle. So it doesn't need the, the add, doesn't need to have its input ready the moment it's issued, but it wants it to read it after two cycles, doesn't need it earlier on. So the way to define this is a read at once. If you put that in, so what I'm showing in green uh, below is the actual dump I generated from by running the minus debug. So here you see that uh, the latency is six and seven, so you, there's a subtraction wall. So what it means is after you issue a div division, six cycles later, not eight cycles, even though, though div division takes eight cycles, six cycles later, you can issue an add that needs the output from the division. We started off, I started off by saying that you have to invest in categorization at the target level. Yeah, we've done that well and good, but for certain instruction, that categorization doesn't work, let's say. So let's say ALU's operations in general behave in a certain way, they, have, they take three cycles. But you have a certain instruction, let's say, uh, I just give an example of uh, counting leading zeros. Uh, it's a fake example. Uh, which let's say takes four cycles, right? So how do you say that for this particular instruction, that's the case? Well, it's quite easy. So you define new sked read writes, so it's just user types, and using the inst rw, what you see there, you attach this new information. So the way it works is for that opcode clz, it says, okay, I'm not going to use the default schedule that was defined, at the target level, but pick up for the sub-target level. So CLZ picks up the P, write, S, A, L, U, W, and read A, L, U. So it picks up schedule that you have defined at the sub-target level, right? And you have it. So that's again a dump. The latency is full now. Uh, another thing that you might have often the case, so you have in your Android processor, it's nicely pipelined. Most of your functional units are well pipelined. But let's say division is not pipelined. So what it means is, after you issue an, a division to, to, to the division unit, in the next cycle you cannot issue. So it has to finish before you can issue another one. Now, so if you, if you don't define anything special, if you see in the scheduling, so this is actual dump. So in the cycle one, you have a division issued. Cycle two, another division is getting issued. Now that's the wrong simulation. The real hardware doesn't work like that, let's say, for the case when pipeline for division is not pipeline. So how do you tell the scheduler that the division unit is not pipelined? Well, pretty straightforward. This is some concept of resource cycles. The way to interpret resource cycle is after you issue an instruction to that functional unit, how many cycles that instruction holds on to that resource? So in this case, it says, uh, if you read it, latency is eight. So division takes eight cycles, and the division, once a uh, division is, in, is issued, it needs to hold on to that resource for eight cycles. So basically all the way. You could have a case where only in the first four cycles it needs to hold on to it, and you just define it as four in that case, resource cycle equals four. Now, we, if you put that information is, then you can see in this first cycle you had division issued, but then it says, oh, it's reserved. So oh, the next division is issued after nine cycles, which is what you wanted. The last example I, I plan to give here is a bit intricate one because it brings together a lot of things. Uh, it's a LDM, so it's an ARM instruction, uh, load multiple. So what happens in this instruction is you, you give it a register list. So in one example would be like, for, for what the one given here, R2, R3, R12. So these three registers will be loaded from memory. Now you could have this same instruction if you give it, you could give it a register of four, four registers or five registers. The point is, they are not all loaded in one cycle. So what I, we want to see here is this. We want to see R2 loaded after four cycles, R3 loaded after five cycles. This is what's going to really happen in the process of the hardware guy tells you, this is what's gonna happen. Now, you have to make a model out of it. How do you do it? Well, you follow some steps, uh, structured way. First step, you define a set of predicates. 
this predicates are just small pieces of code that you attach. So which so only which probe the instruction. So let's say we go with this running example of, of register list containing three registers. In that case, you this uh, predicate returns a true only when n is three. So you define a bunch of predicates and this LDM 3P is true and the rest would be false for the case when you have just three re registers in the list. Then you define a bunch of sked reads and writes, uh, sked writes, sorry. Uh, you define a bunch of sked writes for different latencies. So I won't, I won't go through the, the whole code there, but if you, if you define it in this way, what happens essentially is you say that this is a load, needs a load unit, and you have a list of load uh, definitions with four cycles, five cycles, six cycles. The next step is where you take the predicates that were defined and attach it to these sked rewrites. So what's happening, let's go with the running example. The running example, we had like three registers that are loading. Now, in the, when it probes that instruction, the scheduler probes the instruction, sees, okay, that this particular instance of that instruction has three registers that it wants to read in. It runs this predicate, it's an if-else sequence, and the only one that will be returning true will be this LDM3P. And say, okay, so that's the one that's true. It picks up the associated sked rewrite, which in this case you see uh, is the write, uh, writes zero to two. If you look back, writes zero to two is, zero is uh, LDM4, five, six. So there you have it. You, it has picked up what you really wanted to define here, four, five, six. So bit intricate. It's okay if you don't understand all of it, but this is the process. And when you actually are implementing for your processor, say, ah, how do I do this? That's when you can go back and say, okay, this is one structured way to do it. And to share something with you, this is not how I did it the first time I did it. I had a long sequence where I enumerated everything. Then I came to know, okay, this is a better way to do it. So there's a lot of learning involved when you want to write good schedulers. Right, so uh, the last one is just you attach that. In, so for say LDM and store may have similar behavior and you can attach it uh, using this inst read write. This is where you're attaching the actual sked write to the opcode of your instruction. Uh, this link to previous instruction. Uh, with that, I'll pass to you. Okay. So, <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, one of the advantages of the machine scheduler, the current machine scheduler framework, is that it allows you to customize and extend, write your own scheduling strategies, stuff like that. And I want to take a quick look at, at three things you can do to, to customize the, the scheduling behavior. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is um, customized scheduling policies, which is like, um, high-level directions for the, for the machine scheduler. Um, then I'm going to talk about implementing custom machine schedule strategies, which give you a lot of flexibility to implement your own scheduling algorithms, your own scheduling heuristics. Um, and finally, I'm going to talk about uh, DAG mutations, which allow you to add um, constraints to the, to the dependency graph before scheduling um, that cannot be expressed using the, the scheduling model table chain things. Okay, so the custom scheduling policies, just um, some high level configuration for the, that's used by the machine scheduler. And it's very simple to, to, um, to set your own policy. You just have to implement the override scheduling policy function um, in your sub target and then you can set um, some configuration for the machine scheduler on a sub-target level. So, for example, you can configure the, the scheduling directions. You can uh, disable or enable only top-down scheduling, only bottom-up scheduling. Uh, if you want to, that could be helpful for, for debugging the um, scheduling. And you have a few other uh, tweaks that you can make to, to guide scheduling decisions. So, you can disable certain heuristics. Um, you can enable or disable the register pressure tracking, just, just a few examples. Um, yeah, for the full list of, yeah, for the full list of configurations, so just take a look at the machine scheduling policy class. So um, the second thing I want to talk about is the um, custom machine schedule strategy, 
implementation. Um, so the machine schedule strategy interface um, is used by the schedule Bergamai that Chavit uh, talked about earlier, which is the, the driver for scheduling, and it uses a machine schedule strategy implementation to pick, um, to pick the next nodes to schedule. And you can provide your own implementations, and by that you can um, yeah, basically implement your own scheduling algorithms. So what do we, just, I'm just going to step through, through the interface quickly. So what you have to do is you have to, you need a data structure to keep track of the nodes that are available for scheduling. And for this simple example, we just um, use, use a single queue to, um, to keep track of the nodes for scheduling. Um, the second thing you have to do is you have to um, add nodes uh, to your queue when they're available for, for scheduling. And there's a callback function that's called release top node. And there's a similar function, release bottom node, and the schedule bag MI uh, framework, the driver will uh, call this function once um, a node becomes available to schedule from top down. And that's basically when all its successors have been scheduled, and then you can just add it to, to your queue. And so the main entry point for the, for the scheduling framework is the, the pick node function where um, from the list of available candidates to schedule, you have to return the, uh, the node that should be scheduled next. So this is where you would implement your own scheduling uh, algorithms, your own scheduling um, strategies. So in this simple example, we just um, uh, check if the ready queue is empty and then we are done, return the null pointer. And otherwise we pick the node from the queue, the top node from the queue and remove it and return it. So very simple, but here you have basically complete freedom to implement whatever, um, whatever algorithms you, you want. Um, okay. And then there is uh, another callback that's um, called schedule node, and that will be called once the scheduled um, DAGMI driver scheduled the node and updated its state. So you can update the, the state, your internal state in the scheduling strategy after the, the node has been scheduled. Um, yeah, so the machine scheduler uses that to, to update the resource counters and stuff, stuff like that. And so once you have your, your own strategy, you, the only thing that's left to do is you have to register it for, for your target. Um, and you do that basically by just overriding the create machine scheduler function in your target pass config, and then you can, um, yeah, what, what you have to do is you have to inst instantiate a new object of the schedule DAGMI, which is the driver, and then pass in your custom, your custom scheduling implementation. Okay. Then, um, but yeah, if you implement your own scheduling strategies, you basically have to do everything like yourself. But sometimes uh, maybe you just want to tweak um, the scheduling heuristics that are used by the generic machine scheduler and reuse all the infrastructure that's in the generic machine scheduler to simulate the processor, the processor pipeline. So in this simple example, I just want to, um, oh yeah, so in this simple example, I just want to um, schedule nodes uh, that are on the critical path more aggressively than the, than the generic machine scheduler does. And so you can just override the pick node function and add your own, um, your own prioritization. So in, in, in this case, um, on the example here, I'll just check for the nodes that are in the top queue, the available nodes, and then we have um, a check if it makes sense to, to issue the instructions in the current cycle. And then we check if, it, if the node is on the critical path, and if it is, um, then um, we schedule it, and remove it from the node, uh, from, the, from the list of available nodes. Um, and then if we don't have a node, that fits this criteria, we just yeah, let the generic heuristics um, uh, do, the, do the scheduling and balance the schedule. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about are, are DAG mutations, which, um, I'll, so some, some hardware specific um, uh, things cannot really be modeled using the scheduling heuristics, and so you miss some opportunities and what DAG mutations allow you is um, adding constraints, and uh, scheduling constraints before the actual scheduling happens. And you can add additional edges to the dependency graph. You can adjust um, dependencies 
in the dependency graph using target specific knowledge. Um, but yeah, when you when you add additional constraints to the to the scheduling uh, to the dependency graph, you always have to think it's always um, kind of a trade off because the reduced flexibility for scheduling. Um, so the benefit of the additional constraint should offset the reduced flexibility for for, for the scheduler, basically. So just to give you um, an idea on some some stack mutations, what what's implemented as stack mutations. Um, so for example, on some some instructions on some architectures can be executed faster if they're scheduled back to back. An example for that is. Um, the encrypt, some encryption instructions on AH64, so ASE, ASMC, if you schedule them back to back, then they will be executed faster by the, by the actual hardware, or compare, compare and jump instructions on, um, yeah, on some, some hardware architectures. So that's one case where it can be useful to add some additional constraints to the, to the dependency graph. Another um, case where it might be useful to add additional constraints to the DAG is that um, some optimizations after the register allocation um, are easier if you schedule your instructions uh, closer together. So for example, on AH64, there are instructions that do um, two consecutive loads in one instruction. And so if the scheduler would arrange two consecutive loads far away from each other, then the register allocator might assign the same register to Two consecutive loads, and then you couldn't um, you couldn't combine those loads to to a single instruction, which, which would be bad. Um, okay. So how does how does that um, how does a simple DAG mutation look like? Let's uh, go through uh, the steps for for the macrofusion DAG mutation, which basically does the, the adds constraints for instructions to be scheduled back to back. So the first thing we have to do is we have to find um, the, the candidates, the instructions we want actually schedule back to back. So in this case, just assume that we want to schedule um, B after A, uh, because then they can be executed faster. So the first thing we have to do then is to um, add artificial edges to prioritize scheduling um, A after B has scheduled and, and vice versa. But if you look at that example now, if we would do uh, bottom up scheduling here, we would start with scheduling the node D, and then we have two candidates to pick from B and C. And if we would pick B first, then we would have to schedule C between A and B because of the dependencies that we have here. So um, at the moment, it's not as aggressive um, as it could be. Um, so we can add additional constraints between um, B and C to prevent, um, to prevent B being scheduled after D has been scheduled. And yeah, it's more aggressive now. Um, so just um, the, the interface, again, is quite simple to add your own DAG mutations. You basically have, basically you only have to uh, implement the single function apply, which takes the uh, dependency graph, and then you do your modifications, and then you're done. Um, and then you also have to re register this mutation uh, for your uh, machine scheduler, which is also quite easy, as you can see in the slides. It's just, um, yeah, um, call add DAG mutations with your new um, mutation, yeah. And, yeah, with that. Thanks, Florian. So, so what we saw so far is uh, machine scheduler has a lot of potential, and uh, for, for the ARM backend, we, it is not yet the default schedule, but we want to enable it. And so we see a lot of performance improvement uh, for some cases, but for also, to be honest, for some we don't see. But as it improves, uh, the scheduler gets more legs uh, and, and improves performance. Uh, we, we, we intend to uh, make it the default backend for, for ARM. The, Thing I wanted to, to share last is uh, based on my own learning. So uh, I spent one full year and more uh, trying to beat my, myself up how to improve performance for specific, specific processes in, in, in ARM and seeing uh, where things were going wrong. And uh, at the end of it, I can say, ah, okay, this is, this is the right way to do it. So just sharing with you. So 
We all want to get good numbers because that sells, right? Yeah. Now, one way is to just look at the specific processor, specific benchmark, and just go for it and make some model that works, gives good numbers. The problem is you get kind of married to it in the sense like you don't want to change that model. Even if it doesn't work properly in some cases, it doesn't accurately model what the processor really does because you don't want to lose those good numbers you had initially. The right way I found was first to invest at the target level, which I was talking about categorization of instructions, right? Then look at the processor pipeline when you get to the sub-target, model it accurately. Forget about the benchmark, just this is what the processor will really, really do if it was presented this set of instructions. This is what's gonna happen. Model it as accurately as you can. And then you learn the benchmarks and you see, okay, this is the number I'm getting. Why the numbers are not good? Look at the traces, see where the stalls are happening, where things are going wrong. And at that level, then you say, okay, I have a fairly good model. It doesn't give good numbers for this benchmark that the customer really cares about. All right, I'm going to change some things and make it slightly inaccurate if required to get the good numbers. That I found was the right sequence that if I followed, I really got good numbers. So that's on how to get good numbers. There's more to scheduler than that. You don't want to have a very verbose table gen TD file de description of your scheduler because when you move away, somebody else comes in, doesn't understand what's happening there. So as you must have seen from my presentation, the key there is to understand table gen properly so that you can write very concise, good models. Another thing is not repeating default values. So if you don't specify latency, the scheduler assumes sensibly that you have a latency of one. So in cases where you have a latency of one, do not don't specify it. Same with resource cycles. If you specify a particular resource, it will assume that in the first cycle you will consume it. So there are many more default things that you do not need to write in your table and make it very verbose unnecessarily. One more is it, it uses regular expressions. So instead of having a long list of opcodes which define same latency, same resources, you can compact them very nicely in using the regular expression feature that it provides. So these are just some keys. Uh, as I started in the beginning, there's no royal road. There's no magic bullet here. But if you follow the process that Florian and I described, you will see good numbers because that's what your actual processor will be doing. If you have modeled it accurately, there, you should see the numbers coming in, right? So uh, with that, we are ready to answer your questions. So let's thank sir, our, our speakers. Hello, thank you for the talk. Um, the question that I have is, how do you model accurately the pipelines if uh, sometimes the documentation for a processor says that uh, the processor has so many execution units and whatnot, but the reality is not, not that. And uh, <clears throat> another thing is that um, for what it's worth, um, I have been comparing some code of mine that is highly performing between uh, what GCC generates and uh, Clang generates in the Intel platform. They generate basically the same assembler with, is a, with a slightly differences in the ordering of the instructions, and I get more or less about four to 5% higher performance. So do you have any idea of how much it helps in terms of a percentage in superior scheduling? So, I mean, for a second question, the thing is with um, the scheduling heuristics that I use, it's just a set of heuristics, and sometimes you're lucky and you uh, get a good result, but sometimes you can also be unlucky. And um, so, for example, when I was investigating uh, switching the arm back into the machine scheduler, um, there were lots of, of speed ups, but there were also regressions where just because the old heuristics were just lucky in those cases. Um, there were uh, a regression compared to the machine scheduler. Um, so, yeah, I think if you, if you really want to improve the performance there, you have to 
take a look at what heuristics are actually applied and why you don't get the results to you expect. Yeah, and yeah, I, I don't know the, if the... The first question was also about, uh, w if I got it right, uh, what do you do when the spec says the processor works in a certain way but you don't see it working exactly that way? Yes, okay, and so that's reality of life, right? That uh, the hardware designers have devoted a lot of time in designing the pipeline and, and writing the RTL, doing the verification, and have written a document, but the document doesn't capture everything. Right, if that's the case, uh, we have the traces to see what, where, where these stalls are happening, why, so it depends how good the traces are. So let's say you have dual issue and you don't see uh, two instructions being issued. There could be loads of reasons. Uh, sometimes you, you have an alignment problem. Uh, it, if it is only fetched with certain alignment, you can have dual issue. Uh, it might be just that uh, what you don't see in the traces maybe is the memory fetches, uh, there's misses, et cetera. So uh, what I found, practically speaking, useful was to sit with the hardware designer, whoever has time, to see where are the bottlenecks. Uh, and and then that, that was the only way, re in reality, to, to get those things. Because turning around and saying, write good documentation, that's not gonna happen if it didn't happen already. Uh, thank you for the talk, very uh, very useful to me. Uh, I have two questions. Um, the machine scheduler seems can do top-down scheduling and uh, bottom-up scheduling at the same time, right? Uh, do we know uh, is there any benefit com compared to purely top-down or bottom-up? That's what? one question. Uh, sorry, can you? you the What's the benefit of uh, do the top-down and the bottom-up scheduling at the same time oh. compared to the pure to pure Top down and bot yeah. or top bottom up. Um, so I mean, you basically have uh, by scheduling by two directions. You have two candidates, two best candidates, one from the bottom and one from the top. Right. So you have um, yeah more more candidates available from which you pick your best node, and in general, um, it produces a more balanced schedule. In, in most okay, cases. Okay. Uh, nice but one. Sorry. Yeah. If if you're interested, you can always compare the only yes. top down and only bottom up. For, for your target. Okay, uh, the last question for me is, okay. <laughs> the new scheduling have a tendency of scheduling the node at the very beginning or the store at the bottom. That usually will create some non-live range. Do you have any good idea to solve that? Um, yeah, I mean, the machine scheduler in general does a good job at tracking exactly those things. And um, so when scheduling, Register pressure is very has a very big impact on, on on the candidates that are picked. So that that exactly doesn't happen. Yes. Yeah, when the pressure is above the threshold, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So that's just done a problem with literacy. Um, let's thank our speakers again. I think. Mm -hmm. I need to wrap it up.